but it's chipper today, it's sunny and simple. I just had some announcements for us this morning. If you're watching us from home, welcome to Grace Baptist Church in Bristol, Connecticut. Thank you for joining us. Our big exciting announcement we want to talk about this morning is our Vacation Bible School, our VBS. It's coming up July 18th through the 22nd from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock at night. So if you have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews or neighbors with children, bring them on down. We have plenty of room. We're using our whole church for Vacation Bibles. We have plenty of room for as many kids as like to come. You can register online on our website or... If it's last minute and your kids can come on, just bring them down that week. Even if they can't be here every night, just come on and join us. So we have a lot of announcements that go along with Vacation Bible School. This Monday night, the 11th, from 6 to 8, we will continue with our decorating. So we have plenty of sharks and fish and things hanging around. But if you can cut or glue or tape, it doesn't take a lot of artistic ability. Tammy will guide us on what she needs us to do, but um, come on and have some fun and make some more decorations so we can be all set with what we need. And then on Saturday the 16th, beginning at 1 o'clock, we are going to transform the church into our shipwrecked island. There will be ships, there will be islands, there will be palm trees. I'm not sure what we have in store, but, but if you can help on that Saturday, all hands on deck. We're going to need to just transform upstairs and downstairs and really do some great decorating for our vacation Bible school. So if you can help on that day. Also, if you just maybe just can't be here for VBS, there's other ways to volunteer. You'll see downstairs in our fellowship hall, it's our snack board. So there still are some snacks, little things like pudding cups and candies and things, nothing too extravagant, juice boxes. They're still hanging on the wall. Just take a card with you and bring the snacks back in the bins that are downstairs. And there's a listing down there. So even if you can just buy one or two things, it's a great way to help volunteer. And we also need volunteers if you find yourself have some nights that week. You can come. You don't have to volunteer for the whole week. Even if you can do a night or two, you can speak to Pastor Don and Tammy. And they can tell you um, the positions they need help with. It's going to be a lot of fun. It doesn't take a lot to do it. Just a couple hours. So see them if you can still volunteer. That would be great. And then also, speaking of VBS, we'd love to have our church just look neat and clean and, and just nice outside. So on this Friday night, the 15th from 6 to 8, we're going to have a landscaping, groundskeeping uh, night. Nice. So bring your wheelbarrows, bring your garden tools, bring your gloves. We're going to be weeding all our flower beds and trimming bushes. And we just want the outside of the church to just look super, just nice and neat for our VBS guests. So if you want to come on out for an hour or two and pull some weeds, we would appreciate it or any kind of landscaping. We need help with that. So if you can come to that. And then also on Saturday the 16th is our men's breakfast. So men, 7.30 in the morning at Parkside Cafe. They give the men a whole room, so there's plenty of room for any men that want to show up. Bring your neighbors, bring your friends. It's a great time for men to be able to fellowship together and do some devotion. All right, so I think that's it for right now. Let's look at it for Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this glorious day, Lord, for your creation, for you, the beauty that you give us, Lord. We thank you for all that you do in our lives, Lord. We know that all we have to do is ask you, Lord, and seek you, Lord, and pray to you, Lord, and you answer our prayers. You do not leave us. You are there for us, Lord. You are close and near to us, Lord. We thank you that you are a God that loves us. We just hope that all we do today just glorifies and worships you, Lord. Thank you for this time, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We can all stand and sing worship songs. Lord, we thank you and praise you for who you are, Lord. Lord, that you are, you just mentioned it, praying on the side. It's just amazing that you are God in charge of the whole universe, but you are always there for us, just a prayer away. We need you, Lord. You care for us.
moment, this time of worship. We thank you that we are your children, that we are citizens of your kingdom. Lord, and with that citizenship comes such great power. Comes such access to you. Comes the promises that you have made time and time again through your word. And Lord, we thank you for that. So Lord, as we move forward in this service, we just commit to you as children of yours, as citizens of your kingdom, that our hearts and our minds will be focused on what your word has for us, all that you promise us, and the power that because of your plan, your great gift that we have access to, we love you, Lord, and we praise you. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Have a seat. And in a moment, we'll be getting ready to uh, take up our offertory. I just want to um, let everybody know that on the 31st of this month, July 31st, after service, we will be having a congregational meeting in which we will be voting on the budget. There's a copy there, and we will be voting on two other areas, and that information will be coming out, will be coming out from uh, our board chair, Brenda, who will be sending that out. So again, that's on the 31st. After service, we're going to have a little bit of a pizza, and something to eat, and then we'll come back up here after everybody's had that, and we've been able to fellowship, and then we'll take care of uh, church business. So over there, next to the sermon notes, is a copy of the budget. So if you want to get that and take a look at that. Again, that's on the 31st of July. So what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be taking up our offertory. I see our, our fine group of ushers making their way forward. And as always, this is the opportunity when we are able to sacrificially give back to God what is rightfully His, what He's given us. And even as we sang in the worship songs, He's given us so much. You know, in reality, He doesn't ask a lot. He wants us to access Him, to know Him, to grow in Him. And this is such a great opportunity as we give of our, of our offerings to be sacrificial because we serve one who sacrificed everything so that we could be with Him. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this chance to give back to you what is rightfully yours. Lord, we thank you that we can sit inside this building and we can gather together as believers. Lord, I think even as this morning, as somebody told me, I'm so grateful for my church family. It brought me tears. Lord, that's because of you, your grace and your mercy. And now, Lord... Let us look inside. Let us be cheerful givers. And let us give to you. But in your great grace and mercy, you have given us to manage for a little while. Now, Lord, we give back to you. And we know that you are doing far greater things than we can even imagine. We love you, Lord, and praise you. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.
Isn't that good? Praise God for that. Well, if you're new, um, or if you're not new, good to see everybody. And if you are new, welcome to Grace Baptist. If you're tuning in for the first time, welcome to Grace Baptist. I'm Pastor Tom there, and it's great to be here. It's great to be back. Great to be back. I want to take a minute, and he's lucky he's up in the in the sound booth because also I think he's come up here, but we're not going to do that. But you know, I just want to uh, I want to thank John John Nautis as he uh, as he uh, preached last week, and I know the preparation and the time that went into that, and uh, did a wonderful job, didn't he? Yeah. 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 And uh, let's keep John in prayer and Tammy because uh, John is in a, a season of life right now that is very, very challenging as he balances ministry, as he balances full-time work, and as he's balancing full-time school. And uh, I've got some really interesting classes, but it does take a lot. It's uh, physically and mentally demanding. And yes, we have children's church. I, I see the signals coming from, from the back there. So uh, thank you. But so I want us to keep John in prayer and Tammy in prayer because, you know, and I, I forgot to mention, as he's balancing everything, also balancing marriage. And it's challenging. Tammy, you can just ask over here if you, uh, if you want to know about that. And, uh, you know, six years of, you know, of never leaving the house practically sometimes. But let's keep John in prayer, and uh, and then we'll be having John will be able to preach more as we uh, as we continue on this summer. But we really thank you, John. We're going to keep you guys in prayer for that because you know you take a step in faith, growing, and there's going to be those things that come up that we need to grow through, that we need to overcome, and that's that's kind of been our. Our series that we that we've been looking at here, and uh, it was really interesting when I was had a chance to travel um, last week, as we were driving to our destination was uh, Southern Pines, North Carolina, and as I tell people, much to the chagrin of my wife, here's how I travel. From every the point we start, I go onto Google Maps and I put in the address of where we're going. And I get start. I don't read the words. I don't look. I don't check to see if it's the right route. I wouldn't know what the right route. So we just go. Uh, Donna does not like it. Well, what turn? What exit? I don't know. Whatever it says is the next turn I make. Over the years, we've ended up a couple interesting places. But it usually works pretty well. So as we were driving, uh, didn't really know the way we were going, and all of a sudden we're driving down Route 29 in Virginia. And lo and behold, it says the next five exits, Liberty University. So we had a great opportunity to stop there and, and kind of uh, be refreshed and, and get the vision. Um, and they treat alumni very well when you go down to visit and uh, and just to see and, and have a moment to pray and to and to look. And that, you know, they gave us a gave us a book, the autobiography of Jerry Falwell, who was the founder in 1971 of Liberty University and the struggles that he went through and the way he had to take steps of faith and the growth that God took him through to give him access to see what he had dreamed, the dream that God had put in. The, as he calls it, the big, hairy, audacious goal of creating a world-class institute of learning that builds champions for Christ. So it was really, it was, it was so refreshing to be there and to know that you know, there are people there who are praying for those who have come through liberty, who have, you know, are in different seasons in their ministry. And uh, so it really tied in well to our sermon series that we've been in, We Will Overcome a Summer of Growth. And today it's about power in the prayer. And prayer is a powerful tool. And and as well, the songs we sang are, are talking about giving us access to the one, to the one who loves us, to the one who promises us. And you know, I think when we look at the word power, we often, 
you know, we look at it in different ways. And maybe some people call it semantics. Um, as we look at words and as we look at definitions of words, the definitions of certain words that we have are based on what goes on around us. And the power, and, and power is one of those words that depending on maybe where we are, uh, how we align on certain things, power has different connotations for us. And I think even as we look at the life of Jesus, we think of here's a king. A king is powerful. Jesus was a king. Jesus didn't act as a king like people were used to. That was a different type of power, power that served. But power is something that we all deal with in our lives, that we want, we want, uh, power affects us, we want power over something. Like we've all been there, Lord, I need power over that sin. I need power over that thing that is controlling me. We need power in something. Sometimes, you know, that's a good aspect of power over something. But then we need power because we want the control of something. We grasp and desire power. And sometimes we have to be careful when we move in that realm. But I do know we all have a desire for power in some aspects of our life. And don't think it's a bad thing. But power can become a bad thing depending on how we apply it. And I think that is what we look at. And that's what we're going to begin seeing today a little bit. We're going to look at the power that we can access. And that's a good power. So is there anybody who really enjoys history? Some people do. Good, good. And as many of you know, along with, I do, I do enjoy history, I also have, I enjoy books. We've been through that a number of times. And, uh, and so one of the stops at Liberty was at the Liberty Bookstore. That was crazy. It, was, it really was. It was great. But I came across this little book, and it's called Presidential Inaugural Addresses. And it was every president, <coughs> up to our 45th president, every presidential inauguration. And I really have always been interested in these. Ever since one of the first ones I read was the second inaugural address of Abraham Lincoln. I read an analysis of that. It's fascinating. Because you know what? These inaugural addresses... You know what they're all about? Power. Power, you think about it. You think about the man who ascended to speak there at his presidential inauguration. That is the pinnacle of power. The pinnacle of power. And here they are. And one of the addresses that I found, I, I've been reading through this like crazy, and a little bit of... Uh, Fun facts is Grover Cleveland. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Grover Cleveland. So, of course, when I read the address and then I do further research and then I go searching out other books about certain presidents. So, Grover Cleveland, his father was a minister, a pastor from Connecticut. Didn't know that. Grover Cleveland was not from Connecticut, he was up in Buffalo. But he was his two presidential inauguration speeches. He was the 22nd and the 24th president of the United States. The only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. So I think that's interesting. But March 4th, 1885, I'm just going to read you two excerpts. Fellow citizens, in the presence of this vast assemblage of my countrymen, I am about to supplement and seal by the oath which I will take the manifestation of the will of a great and free people in the exercise of their power and right of self-government, they have committed one of their fellow citizens a supreme and sacred trust, and he here consecrates himself to their service. This man steps up, and he said, You have granted unto me this incredible power. People give it to one man this power. And you see, as he looks at that word, Power. And then we go to the very last sentences of his speech. And let us not trust 
to human effort alone, but humbly acknowledging the power and goodness of Almighty God, who presides over the destiny of nations, and who has at all times been revealed in our country's history. Let us invoke His aid and His blessings upon our labors. Did you see that? And you hear that? If it here is a man who is ascended to the pinnacle of power, that he understands the true power behind everything rests in all mighty God. And here's Grover Cleveland was saying that. He says, I need to be able to access that true power. And I think that really gives us an idea of a power. And then what's interesting is Grover Cleveland, although he was brought up in a Christian home, he didn't always uh, move in Christian circles. And and even as, as he was giving his, his address there, he, he still hadn't fully stepped all the way into his Christianity. But as he served more and more, and he realized the power that he had, history shows us, he realized he, need to act, he needed to access more and more the power of Almighty God. So I think that's such a, a real look at power when you think about that. Real power resides in one place and with one person. Almighty God. And that kind of gets us into what we want to look at. And our main scripture today, which we'll get to in a moment, is going to be in Matthew. But first, let's look at our main idea today. And I think we don't like this. God promises to us place a demand on us to access true power. And if you're reading that, I say, wait a minute. I don't quite get that. God's promises to us, the promises that God has made, places demands on us to access true power. And even as we saw for over Cleveland there, he understood the true power behind anything he was really going to accomplish was Almighty God. If sometimes God needs to push us. God needs us to step. God needs us to move. So let's take a look at our scripture for today. We're going to be in Matthew 7, 7. The demands are here. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. There's a lot of power there in that scripture. Let's pray. Lord, even as we read that today, we read that this morning, maybe it's a scripture that we have heard. Lord, I would bet that many of us here this morning have heard multiple sermons, multiple messages on this. Ask, seek, knock. But Lord, it's very clear what you're calling us to. And Lord, I would ask that you open up our hearts and our minds this morning so that when we look, we understand the obedience, we understand the motives, and we understand the submission needed to fully operate in the power to which you have granted to us. Lord, let your word just permeate our hearts. Lord, let the words I speak be only what you desire me to speak. Holy Spirit, Fill all of us. Overwhelm us with your presence in this church this morning. We love you, Lord, and praise you. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Ask, seek, not. All good stuff. But you see, what's interesting here is as we look, Jesus is addressing a very specific group here. He is addressing those who claim to be children of God. He is addressing those who claim and are citizens 
of his kingdom. See, when you're a citizen of his kingdom, that really changes a whole lot in our lives. Because if we claim to be his children and citizens of his kingdom, then his demands are for us. And say, I've heard this scripture a lot. Yes, it's important. It's for those who are his citizens in his kingdom. Now, if you're sitting here watching, you're sitting here listening, and you say, I don't really know Jesus yet. I've never really made that commitment. So this isn't for me. Good, I have a week off. No, you don't. Because you want to get into this ask, seek, knock. So we want you to understand that this is an invitation to step into what Jesus calls us to so that you can access His promises. So this is for everybody. But this was directed at citizens of His kingdom. You know, the words ask, seek, knock. There are three present imperative verbs. A present imperative verb. See, we've been talking a lot about this as we started this series. A present imperative verb as we grow in faith. And I've been saying that almost every week. These require continuous movement on our parts. Continuous action. Because as citizens of God's kingdom, as His children, He's called us to sanctification, a growth. He's called us to continue with growth. Continue with growth. He says, I saved you. And just hang around and wait till I come get you till you glorify. Well, we, that would be great, except there's this sanctification journey that we have to go on, and that is what causes us to grow. And then sometimes things get right smack in the middle of that, and we can't grow. But Jesus has commanded here, in this one simple statement, you have to have a continual life of asking, of seeking, of knocking. Don't give up. He's talking about prayer lives. He's talking about prayer. If we want to grow, if we want to move on that journey of sanctification, which gets us toward glorification, which is one day when we're in heaven, we have to access His power. And the way we access His power is through our prayer lives. Continuous action and growth in our prayer lives is the call that this morning our scripture is commanding us to Go. Pray more. That doesn't. It. If it's saying, it, read your Bible more, pray more. You know, we, yes, pray more because let's see what we really have. Because we can receive when we ask. We can find when we seek. And we can move forward when the door is open. See, Jesus says, Here's our, here are the commands. Here are the demands for you to do. Because I love you so much, I want you to have all of what is available to you. I want you to access all of the power available. Say, well, I do, I do, I do. Oh, we want, yes, we do want it. But sometimes we get it. We get it. So really what we see in God's Word is we see as Jesus teaches us on this growth of sanctification, we really find ourselves looking at two different types of prayer. Two different types of prayer. There's maybe an instant prayer and a constant prayer. John likes flair prayer. But if we really look at that, the words we're going to use are there's a crisis prayer and then there's a habitual prayer. Both are necessary. One tends to consume us more. Sometimes that's called long prayer. I would say long prayer and short prayer. We have a really good prayer tool here at Grace Baptist. Did you know that? We have a really good prayer tool. A really good prayer tool for constant or habitual prayer. 
Somebody just asked me if we want to do this morning. They're in the office. They're, 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 this is a wonderful tool that we can look at long prayer, short prayer, constant prayer, instant prayer, habitual prayer, prayer crisis prayer. And this will get you into a habit of prayer. Can you imagine, say, if you were to, this is the copy I just took off the counter today. I didn't want to bring out my, my copy. But it's all marked up and noted in the things that I want to pray for each of you about. But this is long, continual, habitual prayer. Every day. Every day, start from the beginning. And go through and pray for each one of you in this church. That is an incredible honor to do. It's incredibly intimidating in some situations because, Lord, who am I? You don't miss. But I know there's an emptiness if I don't do it. So this is just an amazing tool that we have that can help develop our continual prayer, our habitual prayer. And I would encourage you, or maybe you just use, I use it for emails and phone numbers, that's how I have it for. I would maybe start, I said, well, that's, that's a lot of pages. It sure is. Start with a page a day. Can you imagine if each one of us in this church are praying for hey if you can if you have if you can get through it every day oh, if you can get through a page oh, if you can get through one name oh, that's awesome can you imagine I, I get chills I see I know the Holy Spirit's going to do a work but we all are really praying for each other working through that prayer journal because as churches grow and change in their prayer lives, they move from being fiercely independent to being fiercely dependent on Christ. Because you know what? You're going to be praying. Now, some of you are probably saying, well, I pray for a lot of people in church. Maybe there's more that we need. We all need prayer. Amen. But we're going to realize, Lord, this person is going through, through this. Who am I? Oh, we're nothing. But Christ, you are everything. And you are the one who can deliver them through that. We move from being independent. We come in here on a Sunday, we sit, we go, to being fiercely dependent on Christ. And as we become dependent on Christ, we grow closer together as we pray for each other. Prayer changes church. Because prayer changes people. Because who's the church? All of us. We want to be fiercely dependent on Christ. You see, that gets us into the two different kinds of prayer. Because I told you about crisis prayer. So, okay, so you're saying we shouldn't pray when we're in crisis. No, that's going to be like that short prayer. That is no prayer. Oh, Lord, um, you know, crisis prayer. If something horrible is happening, we, we access crisis prayer here in this church. When there's, a, when there's something that comes up in somebody's life, we'll send out an email. Please pray for this person. And the praying starts. That's crisis prayer. That's important. You know what? Crisis prayer is biblical too. You want to see that? We look at Jesus in, in Matthew 15, 35 through 36. Jesus had a bit of a crisis. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. He started giving thanks and praise. He was calling out, Father, Father, I have a crisis here. I have people who want to know you. I can't send them home. They'll never get home. There's no food. You will see other crisis prayers that Jesus made. So crisis prayers are important. But Jesus also gives us the example of constant prayer or habitual prayer. And that's as we see in Luke 6 12. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. See, so Jesus for us has shown us that there's two types of prayer. We want to access both of them. We tend to, as a people, access crisis prayer more often than habitual prayer. 
Christ's prayer is good, we have to continue to do it. And we want to continue to grow in our habitual prayer. That we're continually praying. Because this is a bit of a long statement, but we'll have it up there on the board. And it's on the sermon notes also. As our prayer life grows, we will come to see that prayer is not an approach of extracting something from an unwilling God. See, sometimes when we come into prayer life, we say, Lord, I'm trying to get this out of you. That's not what it is. As God is now one who needs to be convinced. God knows what's best for us. He desires what's best for us. Prayer is in no way an overcoming of God's reluctance, but rather an overcoming of our ineptitude and weaknesses in seeking our desires. What? We're inept, and we have a lot of weaknesses in our desires because we come at things sometimes when we're walking in disobedience with a wrong motive and with an unwillingness to submit. Because sometimes when God answers prayers, we have to submit to that. So I'm not prepared to submit to that. Therefore, you passed up. You passed up what God desires. You know, Scottish theologian John Bailey said, and what he does not offer us is any alternative of method of obtaining our desire. So go on praying all that much harder. You see, God is very clear in what he calls us to and what he demands of us when we pray and how he demands we access his prayers. There's no other alternative, so keep on praying. John Bailey had a very good, a very good thought about prayer. You know, we'll find as we move from, from that crisis or instant prayer, because that's where a lot of us are now. That is good. We're praying. We're accessing God's power in the moment of need. But as we start to move, we can take that crisis prayer. Okay, Lord, I've seen you operate in those crises. We've seen God operate here. As we've sent out prayers, prayer requests, and we see the way God moves. But then it gives us that strength. And Lord, I want to access more of this power. I want to get into it more with you, Lord. I want to be moving. You know what? I want to see you move in the lives of every single person in this church. You know, there's 63 of us here this morning. God, I want to see you move in each person who is here this morning in their life in the way in which they desire that they're coming to you with the motives that they're willing to submit to you. Because even as, you know, as Paul, Paul tells us in, he writes to the church at Thessalonica, a church that was going through some struggles. They had a lot of, a lot of questions at times. And we see him in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. Rejoice always. Yes, rejoice. And right smack in the middle of this, verse 17, pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So as we're moving out of just that crisis prayer, which we do need to access, we move into that constant prayer, that habitual prayer, we begin to have lives that are more filled with joy, more filled with the understanding of who God is. Our prayers sometimes move from, oh God, He can do this, oh God, He can do this, to, oh God, You can do this. You see, when we move into that constant habitual prayer, it becomes so much more personal. When God becomes here, and we begin to see, access, and feel the promises. You say, well, this sounds hard. Maybe you said, no, this sounds easy. It's a threefold command. Ask, seek, not. Usually when things are three times in God's Word, you say, well, there's a reason here it's three times. Well, we want to understand who are the beneficiaries of ask, seek, not. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. Who are the beneficiaries of ask, seek, not? Yeah, yeah. Very fast, bad, bad. I won't ask you, but we know. You know. Ask, seek, not. Jesus wants us to see them. Do this. Access my power. Follow my commands. You're going to see things change. You know, that, that road of sanctification is going to be challenging, but it's going to keep going because we're getting closer to the moment of glorification when we are in His presence. 
But to go along with this threefold command, we find a threefold stumbling block sometimes. Because that is our tendency that we sometimes stumble. If we desire to claim the promise made as we ask, seek, and knock, we must first be living in obedience to the Father. Oh, there we go. It all seems so good, and now we're into obedience, but I touched on it and warned you it was coming. Now, even this morning as I was, I got over here early and I was, I was, I'm studying right now in the book of Deuteronomy. You know, and uh, Deuteronomy 28.2, it, it jumped out at me. You know, and saying, if you're not obedient to me, time and time again, God has been calling his people to obedience. And even up Deuteronomy 28.2, Puts it in some pretty uh, pretty clear terms. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. See, so God has been bringing this message home to His people for a long time. Because He's made these covenants. He's right there in the midst of the Mosaic covenant about delivering it. He's saying, all this will overcome and overtake you. My promises, my power, the access you have... But obedience is critical. And even in, in 1 John 3.22, he says, And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Is there a persistent area of disobedience in any of our lives that we can think about this morning? What is that persistent area of disobedience? No, Lord, I, I, I'm not moving out of that. I can't move out of that. See, God's Word says, yes, you can. Moving from the disobedience to the obedience, you access more of my power. See, so we have to look at ourselves, at our hearts this morning. And Lord, what is that area of disobedience that I'm dealing with right now that is keeping me from fully accessing? I ask, I seek, I knock. I'm not seeing movement. Maybe the Holy Spirit's going to work and say, there's this area of disobedience. If we desire to claim the promise as we ask, seek, and knock, are we asking with the right motive? Of course I am, Lord. I won't ask things with the right motive. I don't do anything for myself. That's sarcasm directed at myself. All right? Because we all have motives. We all want things. James in uh, James 4, verse 3 says, You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. What is our motive in prayer? If you made a prayer, let's just look back this week, maybe two weeks, or maybe a month, whatever you want. Have you been praying in a way that says, Lord, I want access, and here's my reason. Where it should be, Lord, Lord, I want to access your power in your reason. See, what is our motive? I am supposed to. That's what I'm supposed to pray, so therefore I'm going to pray. I want something. Not a bad motive. But is that what God desires? Is that going to bring glory to Him? Is it going to show love for Him? Is it going to show love for others? I want to go to heaven. That's why I'm praying. Not a bad thing necessarily, but that's a, he didn't say pray to get to heaven. He said no Jesus to get to heaven. So we want to look at the motives, and that's a challenge. Robert McQuilkin, he's a former president of Columbia Bible College, said Columbia Bible College, not the other Columbia that um, we might think. Columbia Bible College. Are we weak in impact for God because we are weak in our time spent with God? Amen. I'm throwing up crisis prayers. Every time there's a crisis in my life, oh God, help me! 
we get through this? Oh, so my motive is so I get through this. So I don't have any impact for God. When I can move my prayers to be more habitual and constant, and I start ex- accessing the power of seeing God's will, then I start seeing some impact. I start seeing some impact. And I start seeing lives around me change. I start seeing God act differently. Oh no, God never acts differently. It's just that we see Him finally acting. If we desire to claim the promises as we ask, seek, and knock, are we in submission to His will? See, Jesus addressed this time and time again in uh, Matthew 6.24. He said, what God are you serving? God or him? God or what you want? God or power? God or money? What are you serving? See, if we're submitted to the God of money, if we're submitted to the God of, of worldly success at the cost of anything, if we're submitted to my happiness before the happiness of my spouse, if we're submitted to pleasing the world before pleasing God, we're not going to be able to fully access the power of prayer. James, once again, He'll say the same thing. He says you're double-minded then. If we're not submitting, we're double-minded. James says one in uh, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Am I submitting to God? Or am I double-mindedness? Am I submitting to something? John wrote in 1 John 5, 14, This is the confidence which we have before him, that we ask anything according to his will. He hears us. See, I think that starts moving us. See, there is a warning here in all of this. If we have confidence that prayer will be answered on any other basis other than God's will, we are walking in a false and dangerous place. Now I really, I, I struggled with that statement as I wrote it and I looked at it. I don't even want to put it on the screen. I don't want to put it in our sermon notes. I just want you to hear that. Because you know what? I don't know why I was struggling with it. Even last night, as I reviewed and I reviewed and I reviewed, and I kept coming back to that. So Lord, why am I struggling with that so much? I think I know. If we have confidence that prayer will be answered on any other basis basis, other than God's will, that is a false and dangerous confidence in which we are walking. I think the Holy Spirit will be saying, Whose will? Do you trust me? Whose will? Have you accessed my power? Whose will? And it just came down to that. Whose will? Question mark. I would challenge us this morning. We have a lot of challenges. Whose will are we operating in this morning? It was very interesting as we talk about the power of prayer and accessing that power. 
we had an opportunity, some of us, to sit with Steve Valentine and his wife Jenny and, and the four kids. But only that doorbell would ring this morning, and then we'd say, Milo's here. It was one of his youngest sons. We had a blast with his family. But Steve said, he taught us a lot. He taught me a lot. And he was talking about the gospel movement. He said, the gospel movement, four people, each reaching four generations. Oh, meaning not gener age generations, but four others. That he can reach. He said, because if four people reach four more generations, and then those four continue to reach out in the same way, he would find one to two hundred churches, new churches planted to reach more people. And he explained to us how he's working on his PhD. In he said he keeps coming back to one constant thing. Because that takes power to do that. He said every gospel movement that is showing success, the people in that gospel movement are spending four to six hours a day praying about that gospel movement. I told him I was going to use that. I said, but that really says on the gospel movement in places where people don't know Christ, where people need to know Christ more. Are we willing to change our prayer lives to access that power? Because you know what? Prayer is going to be what moves us from powerlessness to be in touch with God's omnipotence. Omnipotence means all power. Prayer is what is going to move us from where we lack to be in touch with the riches of God and what He has. Prayer is what brings us into the presence of the who and what we truly need. Are we willing this morning to access that power? Ask, seek, knock. Because, you know, right after verse 7 in Matthew comes verse 8. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. We access the power of Almighty God. We see the promises of Almighty God delivered to us. <laughs> Ask, seek, knock, keep on doing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that is moving in our church right now. Lord, I ask that it move in each one of our lives. Lord, if there's anybody who's struggling, says, I can't, I, I don't want to answer any of those questions. I don't want to move in any way. Lord, in your grace, just reveal yourself to them. Let them know that they are loved more now than they ever have been before. Lord, we do want to access your power. We want to see your glory, your mercy, and all of who you are shine into our lives and then out of us into the world. Lord, instill in us the power of the prayer that leads us you, Almighty God, the one who we need. We love you, Lord, and praise you. In Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.
thank you for allowing us to access you and the power that we have in you. And I'll close this with Psalm 2911. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace.